I loved my pediatrician and I hadn't been exposed to a ton of jobs. So when someone asked me what I wanted to be, I decided that I wanted to be a doctor so that I could help people. So I was a chemical engineer for about seven years, uh, working uh, in a couple of different companies all around the U.S. and now I'm uh, back here in the Midwest uh, going to med school. Growing up, I came from a really like strong health background. My mom's a nurse, my dad's a pharmacist. And I'd always decided like I'd be interested in some type of health thing, but I wasn't really sure what type of like um, health field specifically that I wanted to go into. My junior year of high school, I actually took AP Biology. Uh, that was the first honors class I've ever taken. I wasn't uh, as gifted as a, of a student growing up. I got plenty of C's and B's and didn't really know what I was good at. And then I took AP Biology, did very well, and ended up falling in love with science. It's, it's not as easy to see uh, people that come from the same background as you that, that are able to, you know, overcome, overcome obstacles and, you know, become doctors or engineers or, or these other types of uh, professionals. I was really struggling with school and I was deciding at that point if I still wanted to do pre-med and or if I wanted to do public health type of things. Little did I know I was ended up being less interested in the natural processes and more interested in what people and how people interacted with the environment around them. So I, I actually didn't see my first um, African-American doctor uh, until like five years ago. And um, my uncle actually was diagnosed with stage three uh, lung cancer and then Basically at that moment, I was like, yeah, I'm definitely doing medicine for sure. If people are my uh, passion and science is also my passion, medicine would be a perfect route for me to, to, to live that out. That's one thing that I'm really passionate about is, um, is you know, trying to show people that come from my background that, that you can make it, like it's, it's possible to, you know, navigate, you know, poverty and and homelessness and all these other things and I reach the height of a medical profession. I'm on the Belarus's uh, international fugitives list. Basically I'm uh, internationally thought by Belarus. Uh, so yeah, it's a, I, I don't think I'll ever be able to go back to that country. And since then, uh, like multiple relatives have passed away, we're sick, and I can't even go to the funeral. And that's kind of like a sacred thing in my culture, you know. Uh, like just one thing, right before I came here to Columbus, um, my grandfather passed away and from lung cancer. And actually I have already like four relatives who passed away from lung cancer in the past five years or so. So it's kind of an interesting block for me, learning all about, all about that. When I first started out, I only got to shadow the medical assistant, so I went in and I got the patient from the waiting room and um, would listen to their list of medications, and if I was lucky, I got to take their blood pressure. The majority of the patients are straight from Japan, and I usually have to speak in Japanese with all the patients. So um, it's been a great experience, not only because um, I get to practice my Japanese, but also get to see the cultural differences in medicine between the U.S. and Japan. Then I started getting to ask my own questions by obtaining the patient's chief complaint, which was why they're coming in today, and then the history of their present illness, which we refer to as HPI. It's also been good in trying to uh, become creative in ways of asking questions. So if I can't think of the exact medical terminology, maybe working around it like um, swelling, like your arms getting bigger or radiating, like do you feel it? coming up and down the leg, I guess, instead of using the direct medical terminology, just thinking of ways that even with sixth grade terminology that the patients can understand what I'm asking. It's reminded me why I want to be a physician, and it's allowed me to get patient interaction early on in medical school, which I've really appreciated because it's easy to get bogged down in all the studying that medical school requires. I think a lot of us are very used to being at the top for everything that we do. And then we all get here and we're all at the top of the top. And not that we're competitive or anything, but we're surrounded by people that are just as smart as us or smarter. <laughs> there are so many things that you have to balance, including uh, your study time, uh, any involvement with any other like clubs, extracurriculars, interest groups, potentially research. And it's a lot of material and it's tougher. Uh, seeing friends, making sure you stay in touch with family. Uh, I have a cat, so I like to play with my cat. You get back a quiz and you thought you did well or you studied really hard and you get a grade that 
you're not used to getting. And it's been hard for me, I think, uh, because I do like to have a little bit of everything. I think I want to be as involved as I can, see as many people as I can, but also you know do as well as I can. And that's you know why I'm here to do well, to achieve my dreams of you know being a doctor, probably a surgeon, hopefully. But I think medical school is teaching me to be okay with myself and with my grades, no matter what, because it's all pass fail. I mean, you don't have to be the top. We're all gonna be doctors. And I think we all know the stuff and we all are very smart and we all will be amazing at whatever we choose to do. That idea of balance, you know, it might seem sort of arbitrary, but it's, it's crucial to living, you know, a whole fulfilled life. I have spoken to some friends and we send each other messages like, hey, just a reminder that you're smart and you're good and you got here and that's what matters and it's, you're gonna be fine. I'm introverted and I don't have a lot of energy to spend with a ton of people. And so I think I'm a little choosy in like the people that I choose to spend my time with. And I've like picked out the friendships that mean a lot to me and that they're really awesome people, they're doing really awesome things in the world, and they're people that I genuinely care about. And so if I can spend my time more, like, in a more meaningful way for me, and I can be around people who, like, inspire me and who make me want to be better and, like, believe that we can do things in the world, like, I think those are the people that are my friends. I know long-term gratification is a thing, but, man, like, just two years of learning and sitting and learning and nothing else, all accumulating in a big test. Like, is that humane? Is that how we want to form the future doctors of America? Like, is this, is this really the best way? I don't have any necessarily better ways, but I, you can get back to me on that and I'll be thinking about it. I don't know. Honestly, it's kind of seeing the same people every It's like a two-handed thing. Seeing the same people every day, you love it and you hate it because it's like, one, you're like, I don't even see my, I don't see my parents every day. I don't see my sisters every day. I don't see my, like, my friends' friends every day. And so you get really close to your medical school friends, but sometimes they're like, do I have to see you again today? But I think that it's those extra things that aren't just sitting in the library all day that make not only life better, but med school better, and just, it builds you up as a person just sitting all day and studying it's it's miserable but you don't you don't really grow from that your knowledge might grow from that but your real world experiences your character your skills outside of studying and doing well on tests don't grow from sitting in a chair for eight plus hours and watching lectures and taking notes and doing flashcards and just not how life works i didn't really realize that i was a minority until i moved to ohio because i was always amongst people that looked like me. And so now that I'm here, not only am I a minority in general, but also in the field. And I've also realized that the people that should be listening to the conversations that we're having about inequality and um, like disparities are not the ones that are actually listening to these conversations. So now, that I've come to this realization, I'm wondering how do we make these, these people participate in these conversations so that they're aware of what's going on and so that they're aware of, I guess, like the general being of minorities in medicine, because I feel like that's important. And I feel like it starts off with your friends because they already know you, so it's easy to talk to them. And then from then they'll talk to their friends and it could spread like that very easily. Um, but now it's like in, all wrapped up in my head. How do we start this conversation in the first place? Before I would be like, I don't have time to talk to you right now. I like, talk to you later. But like now it's more like I don't talk to you all the time. So I want to hear like what's going on in your life. I want to make sure like you're okay. Um, and that's definitely one thing. And also just being in medicine, I think in general, at least in the beginning, you become more compassionate towards like other people suffering and stuff like that. So I think that's a positive out of medical school. So last night, actually, I uh, was out in Franklinton, which is kind of a, a more underserved uh, uh, population 
I guess, community within Franklin County that's west of downtown. And there's a bike shop out there, actually a bicycle co-op uh, called Franklin and Cycle Works. And this summer I'm kind of working with them to put on some community rides to teach people about effective cycling, how to use a bike to commute uh, around your community. And these are particularly targeted towards people who maybe don't have a car or have barriers to transportation, whether it's economic or other sorts of limitations. One of the things I've done recently outside med school is rock climbing, which, uh, yeah, I have like no upper body strength, so I think it's a good way to work on that. And I'm also kind of afraid of heights, so it's kind of a way to work on things I'm not usually good at. I was just blown away by how beautiful Columbus is, kind of in that like post rush hour, maybe like six to eight kind of period where it's kind of getting towards twilight and dusk. The rush hour traffic is gone, and we were just going through downtown. Uh, and it was just beautiful, man. I think prom was a really fun night because it actually started for us with going to the Vagina Monologues where our good friend Ilse uh, and Olga also uh, participated. And it was actually a really, I feel, uh, powerful message and just a great event to go to. And then... Yeah, so I enjoyed that event, and then we went to prom where we hung out and we danced, and I'm not much of a dancer, uh, but I danced. Uh, maybe a little bit of alcohol was involved in uh, let me do that. So I took 10 days to go to Bali, Indonesia, and this was during our five-week end of repro block, and honestly, it was like the best decision I could have made. I am so happy I got to like experience something else and got to do something else and not just be stuck in this like these white walls with no windows um am i behind yes i'm behind i'm like probably like two weeks behind a week and a half behind which might be alarming to some people but i was like three weeks behind in cardio palm and we still managed to pull off that uh 70 degree cutoff point <laughs> um or 70 percent I recommend overall just having a very relaxed summer during M1 summer. I don't know, that's just me personally, but I guess everybody can have different takes. Because some people I know just went ham and did a lot of research projects, but it was just kind of nice to reflect on first year and just take your time and recharge the batteries for M2. So I did the Family Medicine Summer Externship Program. That was four weeks in the summer. And that was super, super fun because I got to practice my clinical skills. Um, and it was interesting because I saw what it was like to be a doctor more or less, um, how much of an impact you can have on patient's lives, how like important your job is, and how much responsibility comes with your title. I learned a lot of that during the summer. And did some sports medicine research, uh, mainly some knee stuff. My study looked at tear location of meniscal tears and how that correlated to vertical longitudinal tears, which runs along the length of the meniscus, but not the entire length, uh, versus bucket handle tears, which are tears that run the entire length of the meniscus and they actually displace into the knee joint. So it forms a literal like bucket handle looking tear. So we did host defense, which was actually, I personally thought it was really fun, but I like pathogens and microbes and bacteria and viruses. So it was really nice to see all those different infections and how gross they are. And then we learned dermatology, which was also gross. Um, parasites, which were the grossest, and fungi. And it's just like so much gross stuff, which was really cool. <laughs> I received an Albert Schweitzer Fellowship, which is a community service program for professional students. And I've been implementing this project over the past summer. It's really been just incredible to kind of step away from medical school and apply some of the like leadership and communication strategies we've learned, but operate in an, ent in an entirely different environment that's sort of outside of the sciences and the healthcare center and be in the community and talk to people and educate people and empower people on something that I'm really passionate about, which is cycling and alternative transportation. Yeah, and it's just like getting back into the swing of like school after having summer when I went to work every day, but after I left work, I was like free to do whatever. I could hang out with friends, I could watch Netflix, I could really do whatever I wanted. So it's just a change between that for three months and then coming back to like 
oh, now I have to study until bedtime, until I die. So I started like dating someone, which was um, nice. And I guess like I can say that he made the summer bearable, despite like all of the host offense that was going on. The difference between M1 and M2 year, I would say is like now you're thinking about step like every single time you study. And obviously I did okay during M1 year. Um, nothing to like look down upon. But like now you're like, okay, I have to do well on step, but at the same time do well in your classes. I remember being really nervous about the quiz that they have coming up, that like first quiz. Everyone like panicking about it. And now we're like, oh, these M1s, they'll be okay. All these M3s have told me, enjoy your M2 year, enjoy it. And I've been confused because I'm like, how? Like, school is still stressful, but now it's more stressful because of step. You have more responsibilities, even though you signed up for them, but there's still more responsibilities. And I think I saw that a lot of other students were talking about, like, oh, balancing hobbies and medical school. And that's kind of the only thing, and maybe my relationship, um, that has been holding me in, in it, I would say. And you're also supposed to like be a knowledgeable M2 and like really know things, but you kind of still don't. You're still just trying to like get your like feet wet and make sure like make sure you don't sound stupid when you're talking to like M3s or M4s basically. So that's been interesting because people ask you questions and you're like, do I even know the answer to that myself? Like, how should I study? And you're like, I'm trying to still figure out how to study myself. I still like have the compulsion to like write literally everything that is said or like on a slide and like rewrite it by hand, which is like so bad because there's no time for that. I feel like a lot of med students pretty much just like go home, study, make flashcards or do flashcards or study whatever way they do and then hang out with some friends and then do it again the next day. <laughs> I feel like that's the way it usually is. I definitely think that because of like all the time commitment for med school, uh, I haven't been as good as keeping up with everybody inside my life from like college and high school. Although, so I think overall, maybe like friends in general, I haven't been keeping in touch with. So maybe a little bit more distant. <laughs> we have our official mentors that we get like through the College of Medicine, um, but I came to meet an unofficial mentor, I guess, because the first day of classes last year, I was in the canteen asking everyone if they had an extra fork. Um, because as a classic freshman, I forgot any silverware. And in M3, now M4, uh, Tony Fabiano was like, yeah, I have one. I was like, oh, thanks. He goes, you're an M1, aren't you? And I was like, yeah, I'm an M1. So he invited me to sit with him, and he kind of took me under his wing. I feel like I should have another mentor, and I should not be given the responsibility of given the chance to like mentor someone else. <laughs> A lot of us are losing some of our creativity, our our uh, our hobbies. Some people sacrificing, maybe couldn't even make it home for Thanksgiving, um, had not seen the family as much as they used to. Um, so, just one thing that I've been reflecting upon a lot lately is all the sacrifices that medical students take um, just to to be a doctor. Some people, a lot of people, are away from their families, but they're only a two hour drive away or they're only a five hour drive away and I'm a 24 hour drive away or a very a very expensive flight away. Not very expensive but expensive. For the first time I think like ever um, I had a hard time just like studying for a few weeks. Um, my mom is in treatment for cancer right now and so dealing with that was a lot. Um, and also my sister was dealing with a lot of like anxiety regarding um, college and what she wants to do with her life and obviously um, I can't just be like I have to study like that's my family so I was really struggling trying to deal with all of that personal stuff. I think I've always like had issues with mental health but like it's never been as big of a problem as in medical school and I've gotten help for it before but never probably like it's never been bad enough where I like sought the level of help that I'm seeking now. Uh, someone that I care about a lot walked out of my life and it kind of flipped everything upside down. Um, it was unexpected uh, and it was really hard. And it kind of 
I don't know, it made me confused because I didn't know, I guess, what to do with my life. Because when you have someone that's in your life so much that is so integral that they're in almost every aspect of it, uh, that just becomes part of your routine, that becomes part of your normal, that's your baseline. And when that's gone, it makes you uncomfortable. It made me uncomfortable. It made me unsure, it made me feel sick, it made me feel lost. I think the interesting thing about medical school is we're expected to be able to like always focus and like always like retain information, but like when you're going through a lot of emotional things, it's really, really, really hard to like actually retain information. I would sit there for like a few days and just try and study and then I would realize the next day like I know nothing and I just wasted like a whole day knowing nothing. I wasn't sleeping really. I think I slept four or five hours a night just because I couldn't fall asleep and then when I would wake up I'd kind of be in like a panicky haze. Didn't really eat because I felt sick so I lost like 15 pounds. Um, I was having a hard time enjoying things like I normally do. So I feel like I'm normally like pretty happy-go-lucky, like to do a lot of stuff, lots of extracurriculars, play music, play sports. Um, that stuff just started to mean less. The level of stress I'm under, I think, has like brought a lot of things to the surface to the point where it's like I can't just like move through it anymore. I have to like recognize what it is head on and be like, this is like something I have to deal with. And like my portfolio coach, who's amazing, was like, you like you shouldn't be having to go through a harder time than everyone else. Like medical school is hard enough already. Like you shouldn't make it intentionally harder for yourself than it is for other people. It just seems counterintuitive to me and almost backward logic that you're going to build a doctor who above all else just knows things and then is a good person and then learns how to interact with patients. I feel like that's become like really poignant and kind of circling around in my head recently with all the family things and all the other like life things that have been happening. I'm, and I'm almost done. We have one block left in our last, in our second year, so our last year of clinicals. And like, I feel like I know enough. Like I'll learn it all again if I need to know it. But I don't feel like I've gotten that good at talking to people and doing things with people. and. I honestly think that going into medical school, I was probably more, no, I was definitely more empathetic of a person when I started medical school than I am now. And that's terrifying to say. But that's what happens when you sit by yourself in a library for eight hours a day and study. What my friends have showed me a lot in the last couple months is how to care for people when they're at their worst so that they can eventually go back to being their best. And that's, I think important for a physician too is, you know, you might see people at their worst, whether you're an orthopedic surgeon and someone's coming in with a shattered femur, uh, which is what happened to me, or you're a cardiologist and someone's coming in with heart failure, or you're a hepatologist and someone's coming in with cirrhosis. Uh, you're seeing people at their absolute worst and to get people to their best, it's not just about their medical care. It's about caring for them as a person, caring for the whole person. Uh, being a holistic doctor, being a humanistic doctor. It's just been weird because I've always felt that I like helping. I like, especially within my family, within my friend group, I like giving advice, I like just chatting. And I hate the fact that there's not as much time for that. And there's not as much time to just connect with people. And medical school is all about empathy and building and bridges and rapport and establishing like connections with people. And yet it's so weird that we barely have time to connect with each other. I have a problem of like isolating myself when I have a lot of stuff going on and like not telling people. So I actually only told one person um, what was going on with my family and my friend um, and my sister. And she was there for me for sure, but it's kind of hard to ask people to like, like carry a load when they're also in medical school and they're also dealing with their own stuff. Um, so. I definitely am grateful for that person who was there with me, like, through it. In med school, you only get so much amount of time, of course. I'm sure everyone can talk about how much school you have to do, about how to balance, what extracurriculars are important to you. But then when you have to kind of, something happens, and then there's more to do. Like, I always say that you make time for the things that you care about, and you make time for the things you want to do. And when there's a lot of things you care about and a lot of things you want to do, like, you kind of have to juggle and do that dance. But then when something else is added that actually is, like, super important, you kind of pause everything else. There just needs to be more conversation and better conversation and better, like, actual methods to address the fact that 
going through professional school training, not just medical school, but you know, nursing, dentistry, optometry, all of those things, um, they can be like bad experiences for your mental health and they can be really hurtful to kind of the person that you're becoming or the person that you want to be. And it can be hard to balance that out. Sometimes I do still feel alone, even though I know I have a lot of friends and it's just, it's a weird, it's a weird headspace to be in, um, to wake up in the morning and just not feel happy, I guess. Um, that's not every day, but but it's a lot of days. A really nice person that's kind of keeping me grounded is my boyfriend, Dimitri, who also does monologues. And it's, it's kind of nice because although he's also an MD, PhD student, he, um, he has a very, like a very different personality than me. Not very different, but he is more of a type B person. I don't want to say I'm type A, but I would say I'm AB. I'm like, ob. And sometimes my type A personality really wants to take over and I get really stressed out and I freak out and he's like, hey, it's okay. You, you, you can totally do this. Why are you doubting yourself? And then we go get ice cream and then we come back to study and it's everything is okay again. Doctors commit suicide a lot. So do dentists. And so do a lot of healthcare professionals, mental health professionals. So we need to be there for each other as healthcare professionals to make sure those things don't happen and also be there for our patients uh, and also be there for our friends and our family members and really just everyone. And it can be something as simple as just asking how someone's doing, but asking how they're really doing, not just, hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. I, I guarantee a lot of the time when people say they're good, they're, they're not good. So I've tried to be even more honest about that with myself when I'm like responding how I'm people, you know, I'm not going to go oh, when someone says, how's it going? We're like, honestly, I feel like a piece of shit today. Uh, <laughs> but um, trying to be more honest about it, especially with, with friends and family, because those are the people that are there for you. And that's why you're close to them so that they can support you when you need it. It's going to sound so corny, but he is definitely my best friend. And I think it helps that we were friends for about a year before we started dating. And we would talk about a lot of things before we started dating to the point where it was a little awkward when we did start dating. But it's, I think it really led to a, a, a wonderful relationship in which he is definitely my friend, my best friend, and my boyfriend. You know, you only go through medical school once and to neglect things that you're passionate about just because you have an exam coming up, I think, uh, is ultimately um, uh, counterintuitive to uh, the benefits of becoming a well-rounded person and uh, a content individual who does stuff outside of academics, outside of the uh, exam room. I guess I'm just really looking forward to my third and fourth year and hopefully at the end of it all I can say that I'm leaving medical school net effect more empathetic than when I entered. All right, what do you want to talk about? Uh, mm. We could talk about, well, uh, I guess like I could start off with like, uh, yeah, you go. thoughts on step. The big quiz. <laughs> um, I'm just like anxious. Um, like it's, it's just like looming over everything else that we have going on. It's kind of like always in the back of my head and scheduling and all of this stuff. As M2s kind of exit the curriculum, enter this sort of amorphous study time called dedicated exam prep and then ultimately take the uh, exam. So it's interesting to see sort of how the culture of our school is changing a little bit during this time because people are sort of um, triaging their extracurriculars, uh, getting other people to step in and kind of take over for them so they can really just dedicate themselves to being a student. Now that we're, uh, I guess, in the middle of dedicated step studying time and I haven't studied yet, I thought this would be a good topic to kind of talk about and how everybody's freaking out. I think we all struggle with not knowing things or feeling incompetent. Um, and so that's definitely, I think, something that a lot of us are going to be struggling through. So I'm just trying to get myself in the right kind of headspace for step one, because I know that it's gonna be kind of a dark and gloomy couple of months, not even a couple of months, it's seven weeks, but yeah, where I'm not in a good place thinking about it, but I, I'm just trying to get myself kind of ramped up for it. But we'll get there. One thing I like about Ken is like Ken's always like he's always 
he was happy, you know. It's like, like he's always like energetic. Like, so it's kind of nice to have like, you know, I get it. It's hard, you know, what we're going through. It can be very hard, but so, you no, know, we're all going through all the things in our own mind, and and it's always ha nice to have like a very positive vibe. And so it's, it was something I always like about Kent. Like he's always positive, you know, even in you know tough times. Stab is this big, enormous giant that was supposed to be so far away. And all the finals that we've taken have just been little, tiny, smaller giants, I guess, um, that we've taken to prepare for that. And now this big giant is here and it determines our entire career. And it's a little bit hard not to at least start getting stressed about step studying. How everybody's talking about all these diagnostic tests that they're taking and they're not doing well. How you have to have a set schedule and follow that schedule. All the resources that are out there, I'm not sure which ones to use. I'm not sure how to use them. Because um, in med school we had lectures and modules that I would just go over. So it's, it's a little hard to navigate, honestly. And... I don't know, maybe I could seek, I could definitely seek more help. <laughs> yeah, I think studying with Steel is really nice because it creates a really positive environment to study in and it really motivates you and it's intense enough where you're like not slacking off, but it's not too intense that you start flipping out at yourself. So mm -hmm. I think it's a really good balance. And I think maintaining that's really important throughout med school just because you don't want to surround yourself with too much negativity, but it's important to have people around you that keep you in check because it's really easy to like start <clears throat> getting a little bit behind in med school and then before you know it, you're like, <laughs> A week behind and then it's just a whole mess so yeah yeah everybody's telling you all these pieces of advice take time for yourself which is a good piece of advice um go work out another good piece of advice study for 14 hours in a day though it takes some breaks in the in the middle that's not good advice all these different pieces of advice that you have to kind of integrate and ultimately uh, i think you start realizing that you kind of have to filter out things out of those pieces of advice and make a schedule or make a plan that just simply works for you. Overall though, I think stress studying period is gonna be very stressful. So that I'm not looking forward to. I think, I mean, so far like I definitely would enjoy like getting all the information, like just integrate, yeah. like getting a big picture and everything. Yeah, it would be nice. Like fully like, you know what? Cause it's gonna prepare you for, I guess for rounds and, and rotation and everything else. Yeah, like, but I'm not like looking forward to just like <laughs> six grinding. weeks of like just grinding, <laughs> studying for ten hours, or whatever. So, I am confident that I will pass, and so like I'm just kind of like, it's inevitable. Like it, it we have to take it. You can't be in school and not take it. No one's like, let's do the thing. Like, everyone's just kind of like, okay, let's let's just do the fucking thing. That was not age appropriate. Sorry. <laughs>
Uh, so it was really hard to focus because I had really very little space to um, study. In terms of the other big instance going on right now in our world would be the reemergence of the Black Lives Matter protests and recent killings of George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and countless others. And just how one that impacts our society for everybody and how that impacts especially African-American populations. And it's, it's been tough, honestly, to stay focused and continue to be 100% dedicated to studying for my step one exam. Because it's really hard to process. And with medical school, I think it's really interesting that we are taught to learn all this information and compartmentalize everything um, and have that separate from what is going around us. Overall, I would say it's frustrating. I'm frustrated because one, I can't get my emotions, I can't nail them down. I can't identify how I actually feel because I feel so many different things. And it's frustrating because I want to do more. I was looking at a study by The Lancet, actually, and it showed that um, black Americans are have um, higher rates of mental health issues due to just the constant exposure of this compared to their white American um, counterparts, even if they never, they weren't related to the person or if they didn't see the whole entire, um, I guess, incidents. And so I just took that week to just get my life, just to get my life together or just to process everything that happened around. So when thinking about studying for STEP, while also understanding that there are civil unrest and police brutality protests, riots and looting going on all around the city around me, I'm conflicted. I'm frustrated because I want to do something with positive action, but I'm told that the best thing I can do is keep my head down and study. As physicians and trying, well, trying to be a physician, trying to study for step, um, we kind of see all these social problems outside of the scope of what our job is. Like, I'm just supposed to check their blood pressure or make sure that their heart's beating okay and things like that. But we all know that there are so many different health disparities. So studying for your MCAT, they're told you no. They silence you. Study so you can become a physician and get into medical school. You get into medical school four years later, again, studying for a huge exam and the same thing happens and you get the same speech. And like I said, 95% of the time I agree with that. But I also feel that guilt coming in is if I had done something four years ago, would we be in the same situation? Maybe, most likely, but we don't know because I was complicit and keeping my head down, staying focused on my studies and getting into medical school. There is a reason why only four to five percent of doctors are black, even though there's like 12 percent to 13 percent of the population. In like 1960s, my, like only my parents couldn't go to med school if they were lived in Louisiana or North Carolina or a few other states. Um, and trying to fix that issue, I think, is a hard issue, but I think it's an issue that if different heads came together, they could work towards creating longitudinal change. What if I'm wearing my white coat, walking home at night? Am I gonna get pepper sprayed? Am I gonna get arrested? Am I gonna get something else? I don't think so but it's, it's in the back of, back of my mind and the back of a lot of African-Americans' minds. And honestly, it could be in the back of a lot of minds of every, of every student.
So right now, this is the new normal. Having a mask and wearing it um, every day, all day, especially on site. So life right now is definitely different from a few months ago um, because, of course, of COVID. That has impacted everyone in multiple, multiple ways. We just finished our first ring. Um, and rings are basically the, the terms for the trimesters that we have during our third year of medical school. Uh, whereby we rotate through the major uh, departments and uh, services in the hospital. It's uh, incredibly difficult to put into words just how different and how hard it is to be yourself during these times. Just like looking at the news every day and just feeling like physically not safe. My boyfriend is an emergency medicine resident, so he would like come back and have to like basically de-gown before coming home. I just didn't feel like I was in any sort of place where I should be or even could be studying. And it's just been very, very rough. Uh, it's been very anxiety inducing and anxiety inducing because of how everybody else treats COVID. Um, and it's just can be a little bit difficult to kind of uh, interact with people. Uh, and just knowing that this could probably be over faster, or at least uh, wouldn't be as bad as it is right now uh, if people took it more seriously. It's just a little bit frustrating. If I don't know what's happening, I if I'm out of the loop, I feel like I'm not kind of doing my part as like a citizen of this world and kind of how things are devolving right now. Um, so I definitely give myself time to say like it's okay to you know like read up on the news and know what's happening and it's okay to like have time to like feel those feelings and be distraught or motivated or sad or mad or angry about what's happening in the world or like happy obviously um but then also giving myself time to decompress and just you know do something for myself I haven't seen my family since march uh, other than my brothers visiting I haven't seen my parents um haven't been able to go out and do anything I like other than a few select special occasions like going out to celebrate Ilse's birthday or my birthday uh, or sometimes going grocery shopping which is a must. Things definitely haven't looked how I imagined they would because a lot has changed due to the pandemic um, and I've also been going through a bit of a midlife crisis trying to figure out um, what I want to do with the rest of my life. So I indefinitely canceled my exam, <laughs> figured I would reschedule it later, which I did, and I'm taking it now. And guys, it is so much better. Like, I actually feel like I can learn now. And it's crazy to think what just like the environment around you can do regarding how much you can retain, how much you can learn, and how you feel about yourself. So I just finished uh, my first trimester, uh, which consisted of internal medicine, neurology, and psychiatry. I thought about pediatrics, still of course, um, but also about going into family medicine and then specializing in women's health. Um, and then I also thought about, well, I could also be an ob gyn and do even more for women's health um, in that field. Yeah, it was rough, especially starting with surgery because I would get home and have like a couple hours to study and, you know, shower, eat, do all the things that are required of like a human being um, and so it was hard to like fit in studying and then on top of that we also had like resident didactics that we went to so that ended up being twice a week and that was like a full like chapters worth of like reading that we were supposed to do and then that we would get quizzed on um, so yeah it was a fun and exciting time. So at first it was really overwhelming trying to study um, in person at like on rotations and then also come home and study for shelves. That was really a really hard transition for me because I'm one of those people who likes to like sit down and just study for like eight hours and get it done. I'm not one of those people who likes to start and stop things. So trying to get used to studying on rotations while you're there and also trying to learn as much as you can and using those free 20 minutes downtime to do some flashcards and then coming home and then studying for like two or three hours a day was really, really hard transition at first. Now that I'm in a better place, I feel more confident in kind of like the world's ability somewhat to deal with things and also um, just like my ability to study, to learn, to be safe. I feel like now I can study, I can see my great, my scores are going up, things are better. And um, 
So really, this, these past six months have just been very humbling. During my last ring, going through this like midlife crisis of what do I want to do? Is it pediatrics? Is it women's health? Um, I got to see a little bit of women's health and family medicine, doing pap smears and talking about sexual health with my patients. And I loved that. Those are some of my best days on family medicine, which on the whole, I, I didn't love as much as I wanted to. So I felt like I could rule that out by the end of the ring. Um, there was just a lot where I felt like I wasn't able to do enough for patients. There was one patient who had um, muscular dystrophy, um, young, and the patient's mom basically um, was expecting that the child was going to die sooner than the child was expected to die. Um, and as a result, there was a lot of neglect involved in the whole case. I had a patient um, on my internal medicine ring who was 27 and um, she came in because she couldn't hear out of one ear and long story short, I'll spare you the details, but we basically diagnosed her with like very terminal cancer and it sucked. Like I just sat in her room and cried with her and I'd only known her for a couple of days and it was hard. But I think that's kind of in a weird way the point. Like, how are we expected to be given the honor of being doctors and taking care of people if we can't, like, accept that it sucks and accept that things are hard? One of the physicians kind of really talked to us about being caring not just for the child, but also for the mom um, and having compassion for both because we're not in that situation where we have to, where we can understand how hard it is to tr care for a child um, with these disabilities. And that definitely stuck with me. Fast forward two weeks to, or I guess three to, to today, um, we had a week of shelves, a week off, um, and then I've just completed my first week on general surgery at Nationwide. Um, and I'm so grateful I've been able to be there because surgery with kids is a lot more fun than surgery with adults. I did my psychiatry rotation and I loved it. I started out on the psychosis floor because I intentionally did not want to do the depression floor yet because I thought that was gonna be really tough. So I set myself up with um, some excellent doctors who were gonna be on psychosis. I had three days of that, it was so cool. And then um, one of the patients on Harding in the hospital got infected with COVID-19. So they shut the whole floor down for us. Being in the OR, being able to do something with my hands and know that even though like these surgeries are going to cause the patients like a little bit of pain as they recover, ultimately they're going to be better off in the long run. In my mind, it's kind of an amazing thing to be in this hospital because it means that in your lowest of lows, you or someone, even if it was the police who found you, someone was able to bring you to a place where you are going to be taken care of. You are not going to be allowed to hurt yourself and you are not going to be released until there's some sort of plan. There's something in place to help you. So now I'm back to, okay, well, do I want to do do I want to have surgery as part of my career? Do I want to do ob maybe again? Because I do like surgeries and I could handle um, being in charge of emergency C-sections and other like emergent um, surgical conditions that are related to women's health. Um, so I feel confused all over again. I'm basically very thankful that we were still able to rotate in the hospital, uh, getting to see a diverse group of patients uh, despite being in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, you know, for a while there, I thought that they maybe would force some people to take a year off or do online only rotations. Um, so despite sort of all the red tape and additional restrictions and things like that that we're required to do as medical students in the COVID era, uh, I feel as though uh, we really have still gotten our money's worth and uh, we're still progressing with our training and we'll graduate on time, uh, which is something that I'm uh, very happy about. A lot of the patients, I must say, like me, so it's also been nice just talking to patients and, you know, getting to hear everyone's different stories and things like that. It definitely makes the days go by so much quicker. I think that being on rotation is so much better than studying. So I know I said earlier that like your first two years suck, but like your third and fourth year also are kind of rough, but in a different way. So I feel like I can actually be a doctor now, even though I don't know a lot of things and I'm still mainly just helping and doing supportive things. With medical school, everything is like on this 
like comparison. Like you get your grades and then you see how everybody else did. And even if you did well, if other people in general did better than you, you're like, all right, well, what am I doing wrong? When trying to choose a medical specialty, not only do you have to enjoy the patient population that you're working with, but you have to kind of uh, connect and get along with uh, the other members of the team uh, in internal medicine and sort of find your tribe a little bit, find people who have similar personalities to you. My mom was always like, comparison is a thief of joy. And I always would be like, all right, like you, you're just saying that. But really, it really is. So I would definitely say not to compare yourself and to like forgive yourself for your mistakes because no one's perfect. Um, I certainly am not, at least. And we're all trying to just be the best physicians that we possibly can be. If there's ever a time to experience something hard and difficult and see if you can get through it, it's your third year. Because in your fourth year, you're dedicated to kind of becoming what you want to become. But in your third year, it's like there's no strings attached. Just do everything and see how much you enjoy and see how hard it is and if it's something you can do. If you're going to at least try to learn some medical students' names, I think it's also fair that you try to learn names that aren't Western or a little bit more difficult. Um, and for me, it's not the saying of my name incorrectly. My issue is the when people that I've um, worked with don't even try. Because it's kind of like dehumanizing. Like, oh yeah, you over there. And I'm like, what's your name again? And you're like, Ogechi. And then they say, oh, okay, yeah, you over there, come over. And you're like, okay. Well, you could try to learn my name because I know your name and I'm sure you wouldn't like it if I pretended like I didn't know your name at all or confused you with another resident. So that's one of my least favorite things. And it's like, if you can learn a name like Hannah or Brittany, um, you could at least try Ogechi, at least try it. I still feel like I don't really know how to study, <laughs> but did I ever actually know how to study? It's the real question. I would say the biggest thing that helped me is actually Ilse. Uh, we quarantined together until we moved in together. Back in May, end of May, we've been living together and it's been awesome. It's just been definitely something that I would not know how I would be doing without her. I, guys, I really like my boyfriend. <laughs> I will spare you all the details, but it's been really good. I think that I'm at a place in my life where I want to get married to him which is kind of cool. So we've gone like engagement ring shopping. I don't know why I'm telling you guys this, but it's been really exciting. I think that's also been kind of this back end of this pandemic. What's kind of been pushing me through has also just been like hanging on to the people that like you love so much and like take care of you and you can help take care of them. So we're like moving forward in a relationship and it's been just like, it's been nice. Well, it's almost February of 2021, and we're in the middle of our third ring. I'm doing surgery in OBGYN, uh, which is arguably the hardest ring, and uh, it kind of is a struggle that I've saved it for last, and um, I'm kind of going into a harder part of my training uh, when I'm already a little bit fatigued and tired from the previous rotation. ACS, most people know, um, acute care, care surgery, you wake up, I'd be there like 4.30, so I would wake up at four, roll out of bed, literally like run to my car, hope to God I wasn't going to be late at 4.30, and then be there till like 5 p.m. every day. I'm someone who really likes to think through things, and while I can think quickly on my feet, I would much rather have time to sit down, go through differential diagnosis, really think through the why behind what I'm doing. And I felt like I never had enough time to do that on my surgical and ob rotations. And surgery is very like laborious, like my back hurt every day. And I was just like, oh, get me out of here. I like to use lots of words and that's not as common amongst surgeons and um, OBGYNs. So I definitely feel confident now that pediatrics is where I'm supposed to be. I came into this ring like very anxious and very like negative attitude-y. Like not like obviously I'm gonna like show that I care and I'm invested to all the residents, but um, I was like, this is gonna be awful. Everyone's gonna be like super bratty. I'm gonna just like be overwhelmed and annoyed all day. And it's not like that bad. <laughs> I'll get through it. And uh, it's nice to have, sort of have the end in sight and to be very close to uh, finishing my third year, starting my fourth year, and actually being able to do rotations in my area of interest, 
uh, which I'm thinking is probably going to be uh, medicine pediatrics, uh, the combined uh, four-year residency program. The way that I think of it is like to be a doctor at some point, I feel like every doctor should have at least watched a baby be born. So I did. I watched a C-section. There's a lot of amniotic fluid. Was not expecting that. Um, was not standing far away enough either. <laughs> but I feel like I've been doing like the things that I'm not going to be doing ever again, like pap smears and pelvic exams and such, but that you kind of need to do in order to become a like full-fledged doctor. Going from rotation to rotation and uh, meeting a lot of different people and trying to remember everybody's names uh, and then abruptly transitioning to another rotation, I think that's sort of one of the most fatiguing parts of third year is that we're meeting so many different people and we're in such a transient phase. Uh, whereas the interns and residents are typically on a team for a month and are better able to get to know the patients, get to know the nursing staff. Um, but we're usually on for two weeks, sometimes three weeks. Um, um, but often, often, especially in the last rotation I was in, like about two weeks on each service. And, and that was really tough. I got my first vaccine, a COVID vaccine. And um, it was like surreal. I was standing in line and I even teared up a little bit at like the sea. It was a lot of older people um, that were taking it. And I just, I was even inspired, I guess, because of how willing and open they were to, to take this vaccine. When you kind of think about how we actually got to experience the world before COVID or before the vaccine, when we saw the decimation that this, uh, virus had on the world uh, and now that everybody's getting not everybody but slowly we're getting vaccinated and we'll kind of start coming out of this pandemic um, to see that impact of this vaccine i think that's the very first time that at least our generation got to experience it to fully feel an impact of such a revolutionary kind of thing i don't know if it's my connection my emotional connection to science that makes me be like, oh yes, I totally want to take this this vaccine um, because I want the world to go back to normal. It's definitely hard to meet people now. Well, it's hard to meet people at all, but with COVID, um, I think it's even harder to meet with people because, you know, on dating apps or community events or things like that, you're just way more sort of hesitant to meet up with somebody and it's harder to communicate and chat and just everybody's sort of more sort of more focusing inward on um, themselves and their immediate circle and their family rather than sort of looking outward towards meeting you know uh, potential relationships potential friends things like that quarantine was bearable um mostly because <laughs> i quarantined with Dima. <laughs> Scandalous. <laughs> the lady that is off camera uh, right now is uh, one of the primary factors that's keeping me going. I think uh, to have somebody uh, there, to have somebody that awesome there, uh, to kind of uh, keep me sane and uh, to just uh, to have a person that you love so much. I don't know if I have mentioned, but I have a dog and he has a cat. So that was one whole other problem about um, getting them to be together. Uh, they fight a lot and it has been very stressful. <laughs> it hurts that we can't go out and have uh, fun. Uh, I don't know, go to a bar or go uh, dancing somewhere. But in, at the same time, uh, I wouldn't have had it any other way. The amount of structure that we have in med school was just completely erased in grad school. Like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know what my goals are. I know what my goals are, but I don't know how to get there. I don't know what to study to get there. I can't really study to get there. It's more, to get there, it's more like throwing stuff in and hoping that the experiment works out. And as of today at what, 7 p.m., my experiments have not been working. So <laughs> that's fun. I think everybody's research got stunted a little bit because of the pandemic. 
And I was still learning a lot, at least uh, we're doing kind of my technique and doing uh, working with what I had to do. I had to teach it to myself, basically, because it was so hard to kind of reach out and meet with people and talk about it and show them how things are on my end and then got, get that kind of like constant feedback. It was very difficult. So I had to kind of uh, I jumped into the deep end myself and had to kind of learn how to do all of that. But I think it's finally starting to pay off. Medical school has definitely been different than I thought it would be in terms of feeling I thought it would be so easy in comparison to undergrad because there would not be any competition and and I would love studying the human body and and that things would just come naturally and that it wouldn't be quite as hard as it has been. Um, I don't think anything can prepare you for the amount of information that you have to study and learn in medical school. I think residency is going to be cool. It's going to be so nice to make money. Like, I cannot wait. Like, not that, like, I'm in a position where I'm, like, have had a lot of financial hardships, but it's definitely going to be nice to say that I have, like, made money of my own. Like, I've worked jobs before, but not, like, a career. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. applying to pediatrics and kind of knew that going into medicine and, and thrilled that I've stuck with that um, and that passion and um, trying to figure out where I will be headed next. I think during third year I found out that my favorite part of medicine was diagnosing. Um, so those were the specialties that uh, I think dealt the most with it. And uh, because of that, I ended up choosing uh, radiology. I am applying to the medical field of my dreams uh, with orthopedic surgery. Probably in the past like two months, less than two months have like really decided on neuro. I'm applying to family medicine residency programs. I'm really confident in that decision. It's something that I've always known I wanted to do primary care going into med school. Um, and I think my experience is just kind of like reaffirm that for me. Fourth year has been, it's been great. And you know what the best thing about fourth year med school is? I have time to watch the Browns lose again. And uh, uh, no, but in all reality, fourth year started off fantastic. Um, I, I did a lot of work. I'm going into urology. That was my final decision. I'm one of those people who came into med school knowing exactly what I wanted to do. I was always interested in neuroscience. I was always interested in neurology. And so learning about the GI tract, the liver, and everything in between was just kind of filler for me. It's kind of an ends to a means where I, I needed to do it in order to get to neuro. Fourth year so far has been pretty good. Uh, started off with hepatology mini I then went to step two studying, then gen med consults, and then radiology uh, elective. I don't know that it feels like that much different from being a third year other than we have like a different schedule. Being a part of that elective, looking at all the images and kind of seeing how the anatomy, pathophysiology and physiology all connected, um, really kind of solidified, yeah, that I really wanted to apply into diagnostic radiology. Another thing that I've really been surprised by as a fourth year is I came in thinking that this year would be so much fun and, and also challenging, but it's been challenging in different ways than I expected. I have said yes to a lot of opportunities that I have been really excited about and have been longing to participate in. Um, throughout medical school and I found that they have been a lot more exhausting than I anticipated. And last month I was actually in Nashville doing my way rotation at Vanderbilt and my god I have never worked so hard <laughs> in my entire life. Um, they really work hard there but I could tell from the senior residents that they really make some incredible surgeons and I think my favorite thing about that experience is actually that there were nine other co-rotators, there were ten of us total, ten visiting students and at the beginning, I was like, oh my God, am I like competing with all these people? Like this is, this is way too stressful. Um, but they end up becoming really good friends of mine and we're still actually keeping in touch now. And I think I really made some lifelong friends there. So I would love to be co-residents with just about any of them. I think I'm a lot less like regimented <laughs> with, you know, my time when I go home. I don't you know, feel like I, I need to stress about studying or, you know, cramming or anything like that. It's a lot more relaxed. And so the things that I do when I get home are a lot more for my benefit. So if it's like reading research, it's because I'm interested in it. If it's like reading books, it's because I feel like it. If it's, you know, doodling, it's because I feel like it. So I think in that sense, it's a lot more 
my time feels like my time. Fourth year in general, I think it's a lot more relaxed. Like you have more free time and um, and you're taking the rotations that you actually want to. Like it's not like third year where you're kind of forced into different rotations. You finally get to pick the rotations that you want for your respective specialties. So like being able to take more diagnostic radiology um, elective and then I'll be doing IR later on. And then I like uh, general medicine a lot too. So being able to take more of those rotations um, has been a lot of fun too. But otherwise, I don't know that I have any more skills or knowledge than I did during third year. I probably have less less skills and less knowledge, if we're going to be honest. I thought I would have multiple days where I could just sit and watch Netflix and, and do nothing in my apartment. And I have yet to have had a single day like that as a fourth year. Um, so just, just having the ability to do that and have truly nothing on my calendar that I have to get done in a day um, and being able to invite all of my friends over to enjoy that those kinds of days with me is what I'm most looking forward to um, just because I thought I would have those moments and I have not had any of them thus far this year. Med school is so structured and I love structure. I love, I, I don't love people telling me what to do, but whenever I don't want to do anything, like working out, I work out so much better if someone tells me what to do. I'm a bit mixed about uh, the residency application process being um, uh, being virtual. I was kind of looking forward to going to all the different places, but at the same time, um, it does save a lot of money, so that is kind of nice. Um, but I think uh, it's hard to get a true feel about a location without being there, so I think it's just going to require more research and talking to the residents more. And I don't think it's as bad as I thought it was going to be. At first, I thought it was going to be super awkward talking to people on Zoom for hours and hours, but I think now that most of us are used to being on Zoom. At least now, it seems a lot more natural than if it was in person. Um, and I don't think the conversations would be significantly different if I was sitting across for them. Across them. In fact, I think it probably would have been more awkward because sometimes I'm like, t like fidgeting and doing stuff, but they can't see that, so that's good. I'm still kind of like scrambling to get everything together. I know at this point there's nothing I can really do to change my application. Like I'm not going to be like, oh, I made this grand discovery and it's going to make my application so much better. Like that's not going to happen. But it's going to be a stressful several months coming up. Filling out ERAS right now, it's just about done, but I have a lot of tweaking to do. A lot of tweaking still on my personal statement. And then of course, just got to wait for interviews and it's such a craft shoot. It's all going to be virtual. So I, I have absolutely no idea where this process is gonna take me. And knowing I'm not like the strongest applicant, I think also um, makes me anxious. And then I think about like all the things that I've done in the past three years, like all of the struggles that I've had, um, all of the things I've been involved in. And then when I like look at them on paper on, you know, the ERAS website, I'm like, oh, this looks kind of dinky. <laughs> like, Couples batch process is definitely interesting. It's a lot more complex than I thought it was. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun though. I feel like it brings up a lot of conversations that we had to have anyways in the future. I am not looking forward to kind of, you know, all of the assessment and all of the like close looks they're going to be at my, you know, all of my things, all of the, you know, grades and records and all of the things I've been, been involved in. And I guess that just stresses me out. I'm just anxious. The first week was weird. I was super productive the first week. I was working on different projects, trying to get my work done. And the second week I was like, why am I doing this? Like when you're one of those people who like always are doing something, you're like, and you finally have time to just sleep and wake up and watch TV and sleep and wake up, wake up and watch TV. And like thinking about where we want to apply to also, uh, both of our families, uh, we're both from like the same high school slash like we were even in the same kindergarten class. Um, so uh, like both of our families uh, are in Cleveland. So I think we want to stay in the Midwest if possible. Sometimes though, I wish I went there to see like the residents, how they actually feel about the program, because it's kind of hard to get a true, true uh, feel of a program when everyone's, the people who go on interview, they obviously love the program versus the people who aren't there. Um, and so if I were to go actually there, I'd be able to ask like all the residents, like, how do you feel about the program? Like, what's your favorite thing? What's your least favorite thing? I really value being somewhere where I feel really supported and invested in and where I'm known well. I felt like that a lot in undergrad and have felt that OSU has been a lot, felt bigger than I anticipated it, it feeling as, as a program. Um, so I'm trying to find a slightly smaller residency program that's very close-knit, family-like um, culture 
And I do think that I'm finding that in residency interviews, but I have been a little bit surprised at um, the places in which I've found that and um, kind of what that would look like living in those places. I'm kind of halfway through my interviews now, and most of the questions I'm getting now are pretty generic, which is kind of getting on my nerves. Um, they're like asking the same exact question in three different ways. And for EM, we have like six different interviews, and most of them have been 15 to 20 minutes. So after a while, like answering the same thing over and over gets kind of exhausting. So I feel like the programs that have like stood out to me have been the ones who have asked me really, really unique questions. But honestly, anywhere that I get accepted, I'll go to, I'll be happy. <laughs> but um, as long as we're together. But uh, yeah, so um, yeah, somewhere in Ohio would be ideal. It's funny, I feel like every time someone asks where I want to go, the joke is always anywhere that'll take me. But I would love to stay at Ohio State. It's it's really a great program. And I think part of it is I feel comfortable here because I've been here for four years now, five years, I guess, in Columbus uh, by the time I graduate. But it really is a good place. The attendings are fantastic. The residents are like good friends of mine now, and I feel like they're like family to each other. And that's really what I'm looking for in a program is somewhere where people are actually friends. I don't want to just work because uh, I think it'd be pretty depressing and miserable. If you asked me today, I would tell you potentially North Carolina or maybe Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, but I still have, have some more interviews left, so we'll see where I'm at in March of 2022. It's finally beginning to hit how crummy it feels to watch all my class graduate and how all of you guys are prepping your uh, applications or done prepping them because you guys already submitted them and how you are taking vacations and you've worked so hard and you're going to be real doctors by the middle of next year, an internship and making maybe not real doctor money, but clo oh, closer to real doctor money. And we are here still working in lab, but it's okay. One of the downsides of fourth year though is that um... Most of us probably won't be ending up in the same location. Uh, like, um, like a lot of the friends that we've made, um, just because like uh, you never know how residencies go are going to go, and everybody wants to kind of end up at different spots. So it's going to be sad to say goodbye to a lot of really good friends and uh, connections that we've made along the way. But I, don't know, I think like it's never, it's never goodbye. It's just we'll see each other again eventually, and then. It feels like you guys are getting closer to the end of the race, and I have I'm going slowly um and it also feels like I'm kind of treading water trying to get there slowly whether it's a race or it's like a swim race I am acutely appreciating how little time I have left here in medical school and in and, and Columbus since I hope to move somewhere new and it's a it's a, an exciting place to be but also a really hard place to be um, starting to realize that I am no longer going to be in the same city as these individuals who I've become so close to. I've made some really wonderful friendships here in medical school, and it's gonna be really hard to leave those behind. Um, but also knowing that how close we are, we'll be able to maintain those friendships going forward. They're just going to look different. I think I'm a little tired from working like really hard since middle school. And it kind of sounds silly, but I remember like studying, like taking all the extra classes that I could and doing all the extracurriculars that I could. And I think I'm a little tired from that. So I think maybe that's why I'm also struggling in like med school and the PhD portion, because I, I thought I had made it, but I have to keep making it. Every single one of my birthdays, I have had an exam. Like since I was in high school, since elementary, I've never had a birthday where I haven't had anything. So this is the first time I've ever had a birthday where I have had nothing. And ironically, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> like people are like, oh, do you want to do a party? I'm like, I have no clue what to do. So I'm trying to figure out if I should, what I should do for my birthday. So I'm super excited for that. Um, and then just to spend time with classmates and just like have a good time, just enjoying the ease until intern year. When it gets really hard, I dream of opening a cute little coffee shop that sells books and sells plants and Dima would make the coffee and I would take, I could bake, I think I could bake well. He also cooks so well so he could take care of food and coffee and I could just be a cashier 
and pick out the books to sell and the plants to sell. I could take cuttings of my plants and sell them. <laughs> I really got into F1 this year, like Formula One. It's um, uh, competitive racing. Um, and it's pretty cool just because they have uh, racing locations all over the world. So like uh, one weekend they'll be like in Asia and then the next weekend they'll be in the US and the weekend after that they'll be in Europe. We constantly talk about like when we are doctors and we have doctor money, we're going to have 10 tennis courts in our house. I don't think we're going to be making that much money <laughs> unless we sell out. But yeah, or like we want to have a fireplace or we've talked about how our office is going to look and like how our house is going to look and I guess like how I want to have a lot of dogs and um, uh, how many kids we want to have. No names yet. I recently got a like foldy uh, reusable straw. So now I can bring reusable straws with me everywhere. I don't... <laughs> My life is really boring, I'm sorry. <laughs> Seven, nine, eight. Actually, we both matched at Case Western uh, University Hospitals in Cleveland. Um, I matched into internal medicine pediatrics. And I matched into orthopedic surgery at Wash U St. Louis uh, Barnes Jewish Hospital. Oh yeah, so uh, same place, uh, Case UH, and I'm uh, matching into radiology, uh, diagnostic radiology. So I matched into internal medicine pediatrics at Case Western Reserve University slash University Hospitals in Cleveland, Ohio. I was very excited about that. Uh, that was uh, my top choice. Yeah, we got our number two. <laughs> yeah, which is really, really very high good yeah. for a couple, especially yeah. for yeah. I think like getting number two for just like a single person is good for but for a couple. I, uh, as long as we were in our top three, I think we were both going to be very ecstatic. <laughs> yeah, I matched into neurology at the University of Cincinnati. I matched into uh, pediatrics in Spectrum Health in Grand Rapids. I'm really excited about that. The Midwest seemed <laughs> seemed to want to keep reeling me in. Uh, I feel like I clicked so well with a lot of the programs that that were based in the Midwest because I felt like we were all pretty similar for some reason. I know that's that's kind of a thing. I don't know how to describe people in the Midwest, but I think we have a certain vibe to us and I just kind of clicked well with everybody. I matched into family medicine at SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn, New York, and I am super excited about that. I, I matched um, in internal medicine at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. There's a lot of excitement with the match, but there's also a lot of uncertainty. Um, and it's kind of a very unique time and wasn't something that I was really, um, I guess, prepared for when starting out as a first year medical student. Monday of match week, I wasn't sure I was gonna match. So I was like, literally just like pacing circles around because I was so anxious. Um, and so like when I got the email that was like, oh, you matched, I was super excited and just like really relieved. Like, I think I cried because I was so relieved. I was obviously very excited to get Wash U, and then I think it kind of hit me like, oh my God, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm leaving this place that has been home for me for five years that I have grown to love so much, that I've formed so many relationships and networks with people here, uh, especially people in my field that have really helped uh, build me up and let me stand on their shoulders so that I could rise to the medical student and the person that I am today. Um, but it's, it's gonna be awesome and I'm really excited. We're gonna be responsible for patients, right? <laughs> as a med student, you can get by with not knowing much, but I know as a resident, the stakes will be way higher. Um, if you mess up, that can have severe consequences. So I think that's what's scary is, it's gonna be our first time doing this, but you're already expected to perform at an excellent level. So a lot of pressure there. I'm a little scared there's like a lot of emotions that I think come into play like right after match day that I wasn't prepared for. <laughs> um, like a lot of feelings about just like, oh, all of my friends are scattering and I am going to be meeting all these new people um, and trying to make all these new connections and um, going to a new place and just mentally preparing myself to get very lost at, at a new hospital <laughs> because I have no sense of direction. <laughs> I think it's going to be great. And I mean, looking at my future co-residents, you know, I was super excited. All of them have, first of all, really cute cats. 
um, that was important. <laughs> and I mean, some of them have done like postdocs and like whole PhDs and like they've done amazing things. So I think it's going to be good. But I definitely was not ready for all the feelings that, you know, match came with. So. But there's a lot of uncertainty with the match and there's also a lot of sad emotions because remember that not everybody matches into a residency. Some people go unmatched. Some people don't get one of their top choices. Some people put four years of effort into going into one specialty and end up matching into a backup specialty. I feel like if you spend four years like grinding away like everybody has, you shouldn't leave med school without like a position. <laughs> Like, obviously, if you're going to, into a competitive specialty, like, things sometimes don't work out, but to leave with no position is kind of unfortunate. My my girlfriend was applying this year as well. Um, Michelle did not match this year, but we have a solid plan going forward this year, and she's amazing, and I know that things are going to work out for her in the end, and hopefully she ends up in St. Louis, uh, so we'll see. Yeah, even the, the SOAPing, which I'm forgetting what it stands for, but it's the process for after if you don't match, you can have like a week to try to scramble to be placed anywhere. Um, sometimes not even the same specialty, but even that process, like a lot of people couldn't SOAP. And I kind of was under the impression prior to us matching that like most people could eventually SOAP, but yeah, there just same. weren't enough positions for all of the applicants this year. Yeah. So. I think when I started medical school, I was very bright eyed and optimistic. Um, and I, I still like to think that I'm optimistic, but I think throughout this journey, you're forced to grow. <laughs> you're forced to kind of um, become more mature. Looking back, like just how much I better empathize with people and how I'm able to connect better with people. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing how much I've grown. Um, just being able to talk to people, being able to you know, build a quick connection with people, uh, just that and building that trust really quickly uh, has been uh, kind of an amazing thing to look back and see how well I'm able to do that now compared to before med school. Kind of looking back, I kind of divide my medical school experience into sort of the pre-COVID and the post-COVID because I feel like my medical education was drastically changed by COVID and COVID was sort of a bookend that divided the preclinical and the clinical phases of my education. I think also going through med school during COVID, um, like half of our training was during COVID, I think that really just showed me what to prioritize in life. I think COVID created a unique environment for learning and gave us some opportunities that we wouldn't have had otherwise to kind of see the healthcare system responding to a crisis in real time. But at the same time, we also had a lot of limitations and issues with COVID as it affected our education, canceled rotations, not getting to see the same range and diversity of pathology, and um, just sort of being a learner within a stressed healthcare system, I think, in and of itself was a challenge. I would also be remiss if I like, didn't acknowledge the fact that I am a different person than I was four years ago, um, and not not for always for the better. Um, I think there are parts of who I am that feel a little bit broken inside for having gone through this system, which the system itself is very flawed um, and it's not designed to, you know, maintain your health and for lack of a better word, like sanity as you're going through it. The analogy of medical school is that you're trying to take a drink of water from a fire hose. So that's like the amount of volume that's being thrown at you constantly. And you don't know how you do it, but you just get it done because it's almost like failure is not an option. You're down this path and you can't look back. You just have to make it through. My dad always preaches mental hygiene, uh, which maybe I still wasn't great at, but I became a little more chill, kind of go with the flow, I think. Um, and I think to a certain degree with that, maybe a little more jaded too, which I think happens to medical trainees at all stages, whether that's medical school, residency, fellowship, maybe even as an attending, because um, it's a lot of work and it's really stressful. And I think it's really hard to be super high strung all the time, details all the time. If everything isn't perfect all the time, you know, it's annoying. Like it, it's hard, it's hard to be like that consistently at that high of a level without burning out, I think. Instead of just like aiming for grades and test scores and all of that, of course, I still want to be knowledgeable and I still want to learn as much as possible. But I think realizing that it can't be at a sacrifice to myself and my well-being. I have to make time for my priorities, which includes my family, includes like praying, church. So I think to not get lost in it. You're sometimes you're 
most hardest crit critics. So like having people to support you and provide you reassurance, I think is really important during med school. And yeah, just overall, don't be too hard on yourself. I think comparing yourself is like the worst thing you can do in med school. Like you'll just, it'll just be dark hole. <laughs> yes, you were definitely too hard on yourself. I always thought you would be okay for radiology. My completely, like my mindset coming in was like, I'm just gonna work as hard as I can, you know, do, do as well as I can. I didn't really think about um, all the people I was going to meet in my class that, that I really enjoy. That, um, that had such a great impact on me. Um, so that's been a, a pleasant surprise as well. I think especially as I've come to the end of med school and I can finally exhale a little bit and have had time to start cooking as much as I want to again, have had time to go to the gym as much as I want to again, see my friends, uh, hang out with my cat at home. Uh, I just got a new kitten because I'm gonna be busy in residency. So I got a little buddy for Luna who still doesn't have a name yet, but they're playing together finally. I look forward to uh, continuing to grow as a doctor and getting to see what it's like to kind of work on a more independent basis, have more responsibility. Uh, so I'm, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see what the next four years brings. The end of an era, right? For a lot of you, but not for us. It, like it's, it's the it's end of an the era. End. To okay, us. No, yeah. it is the end. It is the end. But also. Not quite as a distinctive end of an era. It's not like it's the end of an era, but we're not moving on like you guys are. Yeah, we're you know? staying at the same place. <laughs> so the people that are going to be graduating with us haven't started medical school here yet. Yeah, yeah. And to any future pre meds out there that are looking to go into medical school, I'm going to give you a couple a couple little pearls. Uh, one. Try to be a solid, well-rounded applicant for medical school. It's not all about your grades. It's not all about your MCAT score. Uh, do some volunteering. Do some extracurriculars. Have fun. Have hobbies. Uh, not only are those good things for the purposes of applying to things, whether it's medical school or residency, but it's good for you as a person, as a human being. All the more life experience you have before med school is a good thing, too. Yeah. Gap year is not a bad thing, I think, like... It'll give you more experience. Like I think having some medical experience before, med like uh, before starting med school, can be a big bonus. Like you'll kind of have like some shadowing or volunteering, or like any exposure, whether it's like mm -hmm. shadowing, um, scribe, doing, being a scribe. Oh, scribe, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. I mean, if you work in healthcare, that's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just talk with as many people as you can. Chat with medical students. Pick the brains of residents. Have some one-on-one -on -one time with an attending or senior attending because everybody in medicine has a different perspective, different view on what's really great about medicine and what's really not so great. And as a pre-medical student, you need to experience that and learn that to see if medicine is right for you. And then also make sure you hold on to you know, the things that keep you um, passionate and make you feel alive. Um, so if that thing that keeps you passionate is advocacy, make sure you're incorporating that into whatever field you're going into um, and have something outside of your career choice that, you know, helps you maintain boundaries and um, your ability to say no and be able to feel human at the end of the day. Enjoy this time of being young, right? Because once you commit yourself to medicine, it's kind of like you're doing it for the rest of your life. So. Don't be so focused on the amount of time it's going to take um, to receive your medical degree. Live your life now, like travel now, have fun now, because you will never get that time back. It is very rewarding. Connections with patients are amazing and great, but they're only a piece of what you get. Um, it's hard work. It's such hard work. Um, you're going to have some of your most difficult days um, in medicine. So just be ready for that. The thing, though, that kind of woven through all these tra these possible paths forward is definitely being able to build like a long-term connection with patients. I think that that's just what I, I really enjoy the most um, is building that connection with the patients. Mm -hmm.